Hello patrons, the great, great playwright Bertolt Brecht had a technique which I'm sure you're all aware of but I'm going to patronise you by telling you it anyway. Um, he was a very political playwright and he wanted um, the audience to not get involved in the plot in that emotional way in the, in, in the way you might watch a soap opera. He wanted people to be involved, but at the same time, step back and say, this is a play, and what are the intentions of the play? What is this about? What are they trying to say? So he used a technique uh, which he called the alienation effect. And one of the techniques he used was to um, get the, um, one of the characters in the play to turn around and talk to the audience and break the fourth wall. Any of you who've watched Ferris Bueller, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Ferris Bueller does that throughout the film. And every time he does that and talks to us, we become aware that this film is for us and that he is doing this for us. He's explaining and he's letting us in on the workings of the film. Now, um, if you watch something like uh, Annie Hall by Woody Allen, he employs alienation effects in an incredible virtuoso way. Annie Hall is a, is a textbook of um, film technique. He talks to the camera, other people talk to the camera, they argue. He uses subtitles to, to, to describe inner monologues. He uses cartoons, right? He uses time travel and he has characters leave the current time scale and go and meet themselves in, 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 in their personal histories and then have conversations with themselves. At one point when he's trying to win an argument with some intellectual big head about Marshall McLuhan, he actually grabs Marshall McLuhan out of the ether and pulls him into the film. And what all these things do is they make you aware of the workings of that film, of the narration of the story. It makes you step back and see it in a certain way. Right, that is alienation effect. Um, for the British um, viewers here, in the 80s there was a TV show called Lovejoy. And Lovejoy, yeah, McShane, remember he used to turn, it was really weird. You know, Bergerac never did it. You know, um, What's his name? Inspector Morse never did it. But Lovejoy, when he wasn't solving, um, you know, crimes through his knowledge of antiques, right? He would turn around and talk to us like a brick to play, right? This has become almost like a cliche now. It'll turn up in all sorts of children's programs. It's, it's, it's become a cliche. It no longer works. It no longer works. It no longer has its effect, right? If we think of a film like, um, let's think, uh, The Holy Grail by Monty Python. At the end of that film, they literally ran out of money and they didn't know how to finish the film and they sort of, the police basically walk into this film which is set in medieval England and they just sort of go, stop filming now, you can't do it anymore. And, and we see the, the, the workings in that way. A similar thing um, was used in Blazing Saddles at the end where the film breaks out of this, the, the genre of the Western and sort of overflows into every other genre film, right? This is a really established technique, okay? It's a really established technique. Now, I, I, I find myself drawn to it a lot. Um, and one of the ways that I would use it musically is when I'm producing a track, mistakes and also the process in which the music is made I like to leave in, okay? Um, I made an album called Kunda Buffer, and if you listen to that album, especially with the vocals, a lot of really let bad edits are left in. And uh, at one point, Theony, the singer on that album, she's put a vocal and there's a guitar solo coming up. She doesn't know because she's not too sure what's going on. She doesn't know um, what's gonna happen. She actually says on the mic, after she's done the vocals, she turns and goes, what happens now? She says something like that, and I left it in. And that gives you a feeling and awareness of the process. It gives you a feeling and awareness of what is happening. It, it, it's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, those recordings where you hear the people talking and they're in the room, you know, when you listen to Miles Davis, you know, the complete sessions, and you take a track that was meticulously edited by Tia Makera 
in the studio and then suddenly we're hearing the raw things and you can hear the, the, that sort of godlike voice saying, Miles, do you want to do another take? And he's going, that do I do I? You know, and you get that sort of, you know, sarkin comments coming back and then suddenly the band sort of <clears throat> teetering and not too sure what they're doing and Miles is shouting instructions and it's not quite right. And then suddenly it all kicks in and it's like, oh my God, it's God's music. <laughs> and, then it, and then it falls to bits, you know. That's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting. Um, and I want to talk about this. I want to talk about the alienation effect on this video. This is definitely a Patreon video. I can't talk about this on the main channel. But the question is, which is why I switched the camera on. My dog's going nuts. What's the matter? What's he doing? Can you hear him? He sounds like he's got something. My cat got a bird earlier on. You can see what I'm doing. You can see why I mentioned the dog, can't you? I'm trying to do it in this video. You know, you're here and this video is like we're locked off here. It's a monologue. I'm almost like a newsreader. I'm talking to you very seriously about stuff and I'm trying to make that all logical and flowing. But at the same token, in reality, I'm sat in this garage. It's really hot today. Obviously, I'm a bit sweaty. And the dog's playing up outside, you know. I utilise this all the time in my videos. Um... And it's getting worse. It's definitely getting worse. And it is, um, it's worrying me. It's worrying me because I've got no control over it. Right? Um, there's a part of me that, that whatever happens, I now leave in. And there's been a couple of things that have happened on the channel that really worried me. I, I, um, I edited a video up finish it or it takes hours to you know especially when you put the little album covers you know in the corner you know when you do that that takes absolutely hours and i cocked one up it was a yes album i cocked it up and i didn't do the edit i just dropped the file in so it completely obscured my face in the video and then i forgot to trim it down as well so this album just appears in front of my face and then just sits there for five minutes and I even stopped talking about the Yes album but it's still stuck right in front of my face just basically ruining the video. I didn't know it was there. I put it up, the thing premiered, I didn't watch it and then a couple of days later someone said something in the comments so I thought check it out, what's they talking about? Check it out. Oh my god I put the wrong thing up. Now at that point I could pull the video down but all that initial views were just the videos over then and so it's there, it's happened, right? It's it's an aspect of that video. It's an aspect of that video. I didn't mean it to happen. Um, it's, it, it's not there in, intentional. It's not there as part of my creative vision of what I'm trying to say, do, or whatever. It's a, it's a big mistake. But what's interesting, and I never understand this, is that my idea when I got to that Yes album is I thought, I'm just not interested in Yes anymore. I'm not interested in whether this is one of their ba the worst or good albums. So when I get there, I just won't talk about it. I'll talk about something else. And they'll all be sat there going, and you just didn't even talk about that Yes album. So the fact that that album cover sort of blocks my face, it's like it's as though the album is going, look, I want to be noticed. I want to be noticed. Nobody loves me. And you're all going, oh, my God, look at this Yes album. Why, why are Yes out staying their way? Welcome. Sling your hook. Yes, and when I thought about it, I thought, yeah, it does mean something. I didn't mean it to mean something. I don't know whether I'm seeing a meaning there, but I'm seeing enough meaning there for me to smile and go, yeah, I, I could pretend that I meant that. I could pretend that was my intention if anyone says something. And when they ask me why you could do that, I could say I had a reason for that. You know, it's, it's, it's a comment on the fact that, you know, yes, to have tended to outstay their welcome recently. And they go, oh, God, that's, that's clear. I didn't realise that, you know, no. Nothing that works like that in art, right? Nothing. You have to be open to these things, right? So now here's another concept, isn't there? there, there there's the, the, the aspect of when somebody creates art, are they trying to document their intention? Most people I know who make art, they think that is the case unquestioningly. Unquestioningly, right? 
They sit there and think that the art will be brilliant if they can realize what they want as perfectly as they possibly can. And if they spent all their time meticulously sculpting this thing into the work of vision and then it will be measured on how much it is, how close it is to their vision of what they think they wanted to make, then they will have achieved something brilliant, right? I don't think that's the case at all. I don't think great art's made like that. Because as you know, I think, you know, art is about the binary. It's about these two opposing things that you're trying to glue together. So yes, there's your intention, but there's also the thing that you're not in control of. And me personally, I'm more interested in, in the thing I'm not in control of. Now you'll be saying, well, how is it art? If you, what, what does it mean? Well, the art is the frame. As Frank Zappa said, I can't do this, is too much coordination, right? This frame here is the art, right? So I'm sat in the frame and you accept that. It's the proscenium arch in the theater, right? It's the CD, it's the record, it's, 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 it's the Bandcamp page with your album with the little artwork you've created and all the tracks and you hit play and it starts and it stops. It's the limits. Art is fundamentally about the limits, okay? And in there, we put things, right? And those things are presented in a way, because of that limit, where we have our attention on it. And what Breck's doing is he's making you aware of that limit, so you step outside it, right? You, you're drawn in, you're drawn in, and then suddenly, suddenly, right? You know, suddenly, you're outside it, you know? And it's not, not... It's, it doesn't quite make sense, you know. It's like, what, what's this, you know? It's, it, this is that that this is as well organised. It's not quite right, you know. I've got to put it back. I can't take it. But look, I put it back. It's not quite right. We, we've got this bit of white now. I don't like the white. This this is not right. I want to be in control of this. I want to be able to put it the way I want. Is that better? Yes. Now, what have we got in the background? We've got like a picture of um, the. Uh, uh, Mystic Gurdjieff, we've got a harp. What does that harp represent? Well, that was relevant to the video I was shooting before. What would be the right album to have up in here? Me's on scene, I can control this. I'm in control of it, but I'm also not in control of it. Those two things are vying at the same time. And, and, and what the alienation effect does, is it, 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 it makes you aware of that, okay? It makes you aware that that is a thing, it's a tool. People who get totally involved in their like sort of platonic godlike approach to making art where they believe they have to be in control of every aspect of it, they're not. It's not platonic because they're missing out on a whole ton of stuff that could happen, right? A whole ton of stuff. You're the artist not because you're in control. You're the artist because you are in control of those limits, right? And those limits are very specific, okay? And I think one of the things that's happening to me on my channel, because this is a really serious video here, this is really serious. Um, and, and, and even though, see, this is the thing, right? This video, I thought, I'm gonna really go in depth. This will be for my patrons, but I'm wondering whether this needs to go on the main channel because this is really, really important, especially to artists to understand this, right? You are only in control of the limits. You set the limits. That's all you can do. What happens in there could be your intention, but it could not be in your intention, and it doesn't matter. Okay? You could basically, right, I can remember a mate of mine, he had an idea for a recording where he decided to put a microphone out of his bedroom window and record a minute of ambient road sound, street sound, from 10 o'clock to one minute, and he did it every day for about three months, right? When you listen to it, um, um, formally, the form of it, you know, what was in there, the stuff it's made out of, it just sounded like a very, very busy street, right? But it wasn't about that. What it was about was conceptual. It was a conceptual piece. You have to understand what that limit is. It's in understanding the limit, it, it explains the art. And what you're hearing is something that we can't normally hear. We hear the same time of day all on top of each other. It gets you thinking about how time works, how space works. We're in the same space, 
but we're in a different sequence of time and how sound relates to that and how sound is captured within space and time. You know, these, these are the things that it makes you think about. He's in control of the limits. What happens in the recording? No control whatsoever. You know, if one guy one day stood on that microphone and started to sing, I'm leaning on a lamppost at the corner of the street by George Formby, that's it, and he can't do anything about it. I mean, he could. He could say, I'm going to edit that one out because it spoiled it. It spoiled my platonic view of what I think this should be. It should just be random sounds. I don't want someone singing. It sticks out. It just sounds like someone singing George Foreman on a busy street. That's not what I intended. And the artist can do that if they want. They can doctor it. They can fake it. They can try and create the illusion or they can't. Right? Um, for me, that limit that frame, if we draw attention to the limit, that alienation effect, if we draw attention to the mistakes, if we draw attention to the nature of what you're doing, I really believe that's where the art is. So, five more minutes left on this video. I'm gonna cut to the punchline, what I'm thinking is going on. On my channel, right, at the moment, that's just getting weirder and weirder. And the reason why it's getting weirder and weirder isn't just because I'm mad, the more I work on YouTube, the more I see the, the, the brilliance of YouTube, but also the limits of YouTube. And I, I wanted to draw the attention of the people watching it in like a Brechtarian way. I want to draw attention to the nature of that limits. There's billions of them, you know, the thumbnail, the clickbaity title, Right, the things that the audience want to listen to, the things that they don't want to listen to that will draw them in, right? The nature of the money and how that works, the thing of being monetized against a YouTuber that's not monetized and that how that changes you, the fact that anyone's monetized is hoping to hit the jackpot. You know, some people have got like over 500,000 subscribers, they're, they're making reasonable money and that's their livelihood and that's their job. Someone like me is making extra money. Other people are just doing it for fun. When I started doing this, I was doing it for fun. And when I was doing it for fun, I was a lot more serious, but now I'm serious, it's a lot more fun. It's weird, isn't it? And all those contradictions I'm interested in, I wanna present that, I want people to watch it go, what the hell's going on here? You know, I would love people to, to because there's something I learned from the music industry. If you wanted to be successful in the music industry, you had to create three tunes, right? The first one was a hit you in the face, wind you over in, 40, in, in four seconds, right? You have to have one of those tracks. When you put it on, and most people will go, oh, this is really cool, I quite like that. Cool beat, and you can almost say the formula of it. Cool beat, cool riff, Cool riff and beat, vocal. I'll, I'll sing you an example. Right, there is, that, that is standard. Grab someone, beat, riff, full band vocal hook, right? And your vocal hook can be, wow, it can be that, that's your hook. And by the time somebody's got those four or five seconds into that tune, they're going, oh, I quite like this, it's really cool. Or they hate it, that's the other thing I remember. If you want to be a success, you've got to have people love you, and if you've got people who love you, there will be people who hate you. You can't have both. If you have both, you have neither. To be great, you've got to be dislikable, right? So you need that track. Right? And so somebody hears that track and they get pulled in. They go, oh, I really like that. I want some more, but I want more. So whatever you're doing, you're now gonna hit them harder with it. So you got the first punch, bang, you've hit them in the face, and now you're gonna follow it up with the second punch. That's it's gonna be heavier, darker. You're gonna pull them in more, but it's the same stuff. You've now got them and you're ready for your third track. And your third track is your Stairway to Heaven. Now, to create a Stairway to Heaven or Robbie Williams' Angels, right? It's, it's that third track, right? It's that third track. If you can then hit them with the third track, because you've got them now, they're gonna to listen to you. They go, oh, they've got another third track. Oh, this is even starts off with acoustic guitar. What's he singing about? Oh, he's singing about his troubles. Is he singing about how he's, he's like, um, no one understands them? That's, that's a bit like me, that is. I'm like that, no one understands me. And I'm, I'm like my favorite artist here that I just like two tracks by. Oh my God, but he's saying to me, if I'm true to myself, 
and live by my own ways, my life will be okay in the end. That's made me sort of feel sad and happy at the same time. Oh my God, this is incredible. I really like this. This is taking me on a journey. It's, it's, it's like sold me some wisdom. Right, that three kits which I've learned from the music industry that you have to have. And I still think it exact, exists now for bands who are trying to establish themselves. I always tell that to my band, you need those three tracks. Just those three tracks and then a ton of other crappy tracks. Because you've got them then, they'll just, they'll just trawl for those because they're fun. But you need those three tracks. And I tr think I'm moving towards that on YouTube. Right, hit them at the beginning, which is basically saying, we're gonna look at the 10 greatest, you know, armpits. And, and you're gonna tell them that, and they go, that's what I came for, and Andy's gonna deliver it. This is how we're gonna do it. Oh, he's definitely gonna deliver the 10 greatest armpits, right? So hit me with the armpits. So you start hitting them with the great, 10 greatest armpits. Oh, that's it, this, I'm really enjoying this. This is, I don't agree with that armpit. That armpit was a terrible armpit. I really think John Travolta's got one of the greatest armpits. I mean, that thing is Saturday Night Fever when he's putting his, he's got a big hairy armpit. I, I always felt that was one of the great armpits of all time. You know, so you, you hit them with that, right? And then at the end, you give them an armpit they weren't expecting. Tom Hanks' armpit, I hadn't thought about that if he's right. Then, you take them on the journey, the philosophical journey, right? That's what I'm trying to do, I think. I'm trying to draw them in with the anti, the anti-matter to what I've done before. That's what I think I'm trying to do. Or I'm just justifying it for myself, you know, that... Uh, uh, it's well, I don't know, I just don't know. I don't know, I've been doing this for two years. I come into this garage, I switch the camera on and I start talking. Right? I talked about all the obvious things I could talk about, like te my favorite Weather Report albums and my favorite Yes albums. You could see a plot going through. And I thought I'd run out of things to say, but it's the opposite, I've got too much to say now. I've got too much to say. Weird, isn't it? Anyway, I hope you like this video. This may go on the main channel, patrons, right? It may go on the main channel. I feel like I've touched on something. It, but the thing is, it's only gonna go up if I can think of a good thumbnail and a good title. So if you're watching this on the main channel, I did, you can go, yeah, Andy came up with a good thumbnail there. You know, uh, something like um, how armpits changed my life. That's not good enough, is it? No, that's just rubbish, that is. No one's going to click on that. Well, they, they might do. Oh, I'm going to go off on one here. But there again, what I was doing then was Brechtian, Brechtian alienation effect of you seeing me thinking about what would be the best thumbnail for this video that you're watching. And you go, oh my God, he filmed that in the past and he had to think of the thumbnail. I just th saw him think of the thumbnail that I just clipped, the, the clickbaity title. I just saw him thinking about it and then I clicked on it and then I'm watching him thinking about the title that I just clicked on. Bloody hell. Made me go a bit weird, that hasn't. Thanks for watching. See you on the next video.